Okay, so my voice is clear actually, or should I just scale it up or down? That's fine. That's okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Matthias, for giving us such a nice introduction. It's really scientifically rich, and it will facilitate actually my uh, my talk actually and make it much more simpler and I will speed it up actually. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear candidates, good afternoon once again. And as you know by now, this is the collective title by my thesis. And uh, in our group, as a matter of fact, we are interested mainly in epigenetics and how often epigenome would be associated with the development and progression of diseases such as cancer, in particular, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and other cancer of interest. It is one of the most common uh, malignancies in the West world, including the United countries, and it is uh, highly incident among the elder populations. And the risk for developing the disease is twofold higher among males compared to females. So regarding the development of the disease, CLL actually develops from a mature and rich experience the lymphocytes, and it will give rise into an intermediate phase of the disease called monoclonal lymphocytosis, which is characterized by being kind of indolent and non malignant but over time with the accumulation of oncogenic events and the emergence of some new mutations, it will give rise eventually into an even more space of the disease called Richter syndrome, which is highly aggressive and incurable. So prognostically, CRL is comprised of two related entities. Based on the mutation status of the immunoglobulin heavy chain variable region, as pointed out by Matthias in his presentation, CLL is uh, classified into mutated CLL, which is characterized by a better prognosis, and unmutated CLL, which is on the other hand side associated with clinically inferior outcomes and shorter survival. So to understand more about that, I'm showing you actually here the normal development of uh, B lymphocyte from a commonly employed progenitor in the bone marrow. As an immature B cell, it will migrate towards the secondary lymphoid organs and it will mature in the lymph nodes either inside the germinal center, where it undergoes some high mutations to the IgHV. And from these populations of mature B lymphocyte, the mutated CLL might rise upon the oncogenic feeds. On the other hand side, in the marginal zone, the somatic hypermutations are not necessary, if any at all. And the unmutated CLL might be developing from these populations of mature B lymphocytes. So coming to the pathogenesis of the disease, it mainly hinges on the B cell receptor activation, the mutation status of IBHP, as I mentioned, the interaction to the components of the microenvironment, and the cytogenetic regions. And regarding this last one, I'm showing you here the most common and frequent mutations of cytogenetic regions in CLL. These two regions, actually, the lesion protein 214 and trisomy 12, are believed to be the inducing factors for CLL development. And this is evidenced by their high frequency in the early phase of the disease. And the rest of these mutations actually have been shown to arise as the disease proceeds for progression. And accordingly, it is very unlikely that they would be the inducing factors, but rather they would foster the acquisition of the Madigan phenotype or CLL. And actually, I would say that uh, the emergence or the acquisition of these mutations with the disease force is suggested to be epigenetically attributed. So coming to epigenetics, what is that about and why? Well, actually, I didn't manage to push a bold definition of epigenetics, so forgive me about that, but I just wanted you to take a look on these biological phenomena we're all familiar with. But most interestingly, and also as discussed by Matthias, uh, an organism, let's say we as humans, are comprised of approximately 200 types of cells. They're all genetically identical, however, they are genetically distinct. So how do we figure this out, actually, and can we put an explanation under the lights of the standard dogma of molecular biology as we all know it? The question would be, in other words, is it just about the genes? One of the most intriguing paradoxes in molecular biology is the gene value paradox that describes the inconsistent relationship between the organism of complexity and the number of protein coding sequences. And here we have a couple of entirely different examples, the highly complicated human and the simple microscopic form C. elegans. When it comes to the protein coding genes, the mean number in either organism is 20,000 genes, approximately. And accordingly, I believe that it is not just about the genes, and I'd rather consider other factors, perhaps, the genome size expansion. As we all know, that during the evolution of the higher organisms, their genomes had experienced size expansion as a consequence of the emergence of non-coding elements. And here are the elements of the human genome. 
What we have learned from the intro project in the post-sequencing era is that the sequences that are synonymous to proteins represent less than 1.5% of the whole human DNA, while the rest of the elements are non-coding for proteins. And then, there is a tremendous need for a highly sophisticated mechanism to put a control over the genome, and ends up not only structural packaging of the DNA within the nuclear vicinity, but also to organize it as a chromatin. And the chromatin, in turn, is compartmentalized into both structurally and functionally distinct domain, namely the euchromatin and the heterochromatin in general. The euchromatin is supposedly open structure and transcriptionally permissive, and the other way around for the heterochromatin, which could be either facultative or constitutive. Bottom line, this compartmentalization would serve actually to control the gene expression in a structural and functional manner in accordance to the cellular conditions and the developmental needs so that the gene expression profile would be accurately established and the phenotype would be maintained. Thus, these domains need to be demarcated so that there will be no spreading of either the oppressive or the permissive structures across the whole chromatin or the whole genome. And here comes the importance of epigenetic mechanisms, either at the DNA level by methylation or histone post translation modification. And I'm showing you some epigenetic marks. They are surrogates of either active or repressed chromatin status. And in my line of work, I'm mainly interested in the double dose DNA methylation and histone post translation and modification by polycom progressive complex 2. So when it comes to establishing an epigenetic pattern, suppose here that this is an epigenetic mark, 5 method cytosine or H3K273, for instance. It is supposed to be established by a wider enzyme. I will turn over, it is removed by a dedicated eraser. And it is not just about the balance between the wider eraser activities. There are also other groups of proteins called the readers. A reader protein would recognize specific epigenetic mark by specific domain, and it will moderate the interplay between the different epigenetic features, either the mutually exclusive or reinforcing. And it might also recruit some downstream effector proteins that would serve in uh, the establishment of the local chromatin organization. This is all, of course, in addition to the initiators. I'm hereby referring to the long term coding RNAs, which have been proven to serve in a wide range of functionalities regarding chromatin organization and configuration. As best expressed by Edwin Bird, one of the gurus of epigenetics that we are not hardwired by our genes, we are rather functions of our genomes. So coming to my thesis and what we want you to do. We made use of these next generation sequencing techniques, as you can see, and we wanted to investigate the possible implication of DNA methylation in a non canonical mode of action in transcription and activation of CLS signature genes, and that would be the topic for project number one and project number three. And for the second project, by means of sheep sequencing, we wanted to map the global distribution patterns of easy rich tool, which is the catalytic subunit of the polycom progressive complex 2, and its prototypical mark, H3K273, in the two subgroups of CLL, mutated and unmutated. So this is actually my first project, gene body hypermethylation controls, cryptic promoter and mu 26 a dependent easy rich tool regulation of that one in CLL. I'm actually showing you here the distribution patterns of the CPG islands across the human genome. As you can see that they are shown by model distribution. With this by model distribution, one might think that the DNA methylation within these different vicinities might be influencing the gene expression control in a differential manner. We all know that the hypermethylation at the CPG islands at the promoter region is always associated to silencing, but that is not necessarily the same thing when it comes to the orphan CPG islands, which could be either intragenic or intragenic regions. So in this project, we are showing in brief that methylation of the CPG islands in the gene body region is associated with active expression of the corresponding gene by means of controlling antisense insurance transcription. And upon the removal of the methylation by the use of a chemical inhibitor called the oxy I'm going to call it that from now onwards, there will be a resumption of the antisense insurance transcription and it will be antagonizing the corresponding gene expression. So how did we come up with this model? Well, the story has actually started from this paper, which was published uh, by our group in 2016, but was not part of it. But by means of MPD sequencing, they were able to locate the differentially methylated region at the DNA level between CLL and normal B cells. 
And in brief, regarding the workflow of MDD sequencing, of course, the starting material is the genomic DNA, and it is supposed to be shared by some patient, so that we will have fragments, either methylated or unmethylated. The methylated fragments supposed to be captured by the biotinylated uh, MDD domains, and then it will be followed by a clicked chemistry reaction to do the pull down. And then that will be followed by dilution, lipo preparation, negative generation sequencing by phenomena, and the raw data will be subject to bioinformatic analysis, and eventually they came up with the hypermethylated genes in CLS 7 1750 genes. Interestingly, upon the integration between the data sets that were obtained from the MPD sequencing with an independent RNA seq analysis that was published in 2014. They have found that some of the hypermethylated genes were positively correlated with active expression in CLL. And accordingly, we have got our preliminary assumption that DNA methylation is functioning in gene activation. And out of these genes, we have selected TET1 as a model gene for the investigation. From empty sequencing, actually, we were also able to locate the differentially hypermethylated region in the uh, transcriptional unit of the gene. It is exactly located within the intronic region between exon number one and exon number two. And reproducibly, we validated these data by pyro sequencing using independent CLL samples. And as you can see, there is no significant differential methylation pattern at the promoter region of the gene, while in the gene body, the, uh, there is a hypermethylation significantly in CLL compared to models. In the same way, we also validated the, the, the RNA seq analysis and we showed that TEF1 is overexpressed uh, in CLL compared to normals. And that was done by RT-PCR using the same samples of CLL. Thus, we became closer to our postulation and we managed to extend it to do sort of a mechanistic work in the subjects. Okay, so that treatment of four cell line models, two CLL, two NCL models, was associated by a significant reduced expression of that one gene. And actually, we were focusing in this study on the CLL models XG3 and MECON cell lines. And as you can see, that the reduced expression pattern of that one was observed at both mRNA and protein level as well, following the right treatment. Fine. Based on what we have understood about uh, CPG islands, by default, they are well suited for promoter activities regardless of their genomic location. So we started to think about the possible existence of a cryptic promoter in the hypermethylated region that we have obtained from uh, uh, MDD sequencing. So we managed to amplify this region and clone it into PGR3 vector containing the separate supported gene. And the cloning was either in the sense or the anti-sense orientation. And of course, the luciferase activity was performed in comparison to a basic vector that served as a negative control and a strong promoter-containing vector that served as the positive control. Interestingly, the luciferase activity that was exerted by the hypermethylated region when it was strong in the anti-sense orientation was much more than what is observed when it was in the positive orientation. And it is even comparable to what was observed actually by the positive uh, the strong promoter vector SB40. So we realized that yes, there is a cryptic promoter and we want you to be for the intronic transcription. So we designed sets of RT-PCR primers across the hypermethylated region and upon the direct treatment, we detected a significant elevation of the intronic transcription, specifically and most significantly at this upstream region, which is a little bit towards the five prime region. So to further confirm that, we also did a strand-specific cDNA synthesis followed by PCR. The use of primers specific to the sense strand didn't show any significant band at all upon uh, the PCR. Well, as you can see from the anti-sense, there is a clear and lucid increase in the band intensity following the right treatment in either sublines. And uh, we were sure actually that these uh, the intronic transcription, uh, uh, transcription is real, they are modified, they are not artifacts by the use of an active control, which was a moxidine name prepared in absence of RT enzyme, and we didn't find any significant or any detectable band at all by the PCR. Yeah, we asked them about the occupancy of RNA plus 2 at either the TAT1 promoter or the cryptic promoter. Our 
Watching experiments reveal that following the back treatment, our naval MRS2 showed reduced occupancy significantly at the platform promoter, and the other background was observed at the cryptic promoter. And one thing actually, the, uh, the region that was in which for MRS2 in this cryptic area was a little bit towards the 3' end, downstream somehow. So we cloned this region once again by this uh, strategy that I have uh, explained a few slides ago. And we found that it showed even much, much more activity uh, than was observed before, and it even exceeded the activity by the cost uh, control promoter. So then, the cryptic transcription is attenuating the corresponding gene expression and inhibits the elongation. We are showing actually another loop for regulation of that one gene in CLM by near 26A EZH2 uh, loop. Regarding the microRNA 26A, this microRNA is diminished at the expression level in CLL by hypermethylation at the promoter region. And in our experiments in the cell lines, following the direct treatment, this microRNA showed upregulation significantly. And accordingly, that was associated by significant reduced expression of EZH2 since EZH2 mRNA is a target, downstream target for this microRNA. And as you can see here, I think, yeah, it is small somehow, but, yeah. Uh, EZH2 and TEP1 are showing almost the same pattern for the differential expression following the direct treatment, which made us think about a possible implication of EZH2 in controlling the TEP1 expression. So, upon checking the genome fracture, we found an expected binding site for EZH2 at the TEP1 promoter. And we managed them to silence EZH2 in all of these cell lines, and that was associated by reduced expression of that one gene, indicating that the gene is positively regulated by EZH2 in a non canonical mode of action, which is independent from being um, an integral component of polycom repressive complex 2. Furthermore, our shift experiments revealed that following the direct treatment, EZH2 showed reduced occupancy at that one promoter, but that wasn't associated by any significant change regarding the enrichment or the deposition of H3K27 in H3, further confirming that it is functioning away from PRC2. So to conclude, we are showing two loops of regulation of that one gene in CLL by uh, hypermethylation at the gene body region that is controlling cryptic antisense transcription and thereby it protects the corresponding gene expression and keep it hyper-expressed or over-expressed. And in addition to that, we are showing that EZH2 is binding at the TEP1 promoter and in non-canonical mode of action, it is functioning in the transactivation of the gene in CLL specifically. Mm -hmm. So, the second project EZH2 upregulates PR3K APT pathway for IGF1R and MIP in aggressive, in clinically aggressive CFM. This is actually a finding of uh, our collaborators, Quicker Fosnquist and his group. They showed that EZH2 overexpression is associated with poor survival in uh, the clinically aggressive forms of CFM. And regarding EZH2, as I mentioned before, that it is the catalytic subunit of polycom progressive complex 2. And this is actually the map of EZH2 as a protein. By virtue of its set domain, which is located at the C uh, terminal loop, it is catalyzing the trimethylation of lysine number 27 on this non free tail. And actually, the set domain is only active as long as EZH2 is bound to the other regulatory subunits, EED and SUS12. And on the recognition of the product itself, H3K27 and H3, it is uh, recognized by EED and it will further stimulate the central brain for further catalysis. And that was also explained very nicely by Matthias, the self right and read mechanism for establishing the science. Okay, so this is actually our study design. We managed to do chromatic immune presentation using the CLL samples, six mutated, six unmutated samples, and we prepared the IDs. Using, using antibodies against EZH2 and H3K27 and H3. We did the IPs, we prepared the DNA, and the library was prepared and subject them to next generation sequencing by the Illumina platform, and the bioinformatic analysis was thankfully done by Sokoshi. Right? So, this is the genome wide mapping of EZH2 and H3K27 and H3 in the two subgroups, mutated and unmutated. If you see here, the majority of the EZH2 peaks 
in both uh, subgroups were mainly located within the protein coding region, and the same was observed for H3K27 and 3. And actually, these are the distribution patterns of EZH2 in mutated and unmutated. As you can see, that it is almost the same pattern. And the majority of the peaks were mapped to promote transcription start site in line with being a master regulator of gene expression. Okay, so these heat maps actually are showing the peaks, uh, the peak size of EZH2 in mutated and unmutated CLN, and the same also for H3K27 and 3. We managed to overlap the total peaks of EZH2 in mutated and unmutated, and we came up with 90% overlap, suggesting a unifying role for EZH2. However, however, we managed to overlap all of these peaks, all EZH2 peaks in CLN, mutated and unmutated, with the peaks of H3K273, and we came up with this list of genes. They were termed EZH2 overlapping genes. And when we split it, these genes between the two subgroups, the overlap has become 45%, not as observed before, telling that EZH2 is behaving differentially between the two subgroups in terms of enrichment and functionality. Why is that functionality? Because these EZH2 overlapping genes were subject to pathway analysis using the cat terms. And, uh, <clears throat> and we came up with these cancer-related pathways, and most interestingly, PR3K APT signaling, which was found to be differentially enriched for EZH2 between the two subgroups. And as you can see here, actually, it is more significantly enriched in the unmutated CLL compared to mutated. This is actually an RNA seq analysis. We did it uh, using a uh, data set that was published in 2014. This is our paper, actually. And we found that approximately 25% of these individual overlapping genes were differentially expressed between the two subgroups. And the majority of these genes were upregulated in CLL. And that would suggest an um, implication of EZH2 in active gene expression in a context specific manner, specifically in the unmutated CL. Yeah. yeah, these genes actually are the top uh, significant genes. They were both significantly uh, differentially expressed between the two subgroups and differentially enriched for EZH2 between the two subgroups also and clustered to PR3K ATT signaling. They were used for the validation by sheet PCR using independent CLL samples and thus we could validate our sheet uh, sequencing properly. In, a, in agreement to what has been published before regarding the pathway PR3K ATT signaling, we are also showing that the pathway is more active in the unmutated CLL, evidenced by the increased band intensity of the phosphorylated egg at serine number 473. And we also did Western plotting, this Western plotting in the cell line models. Actually, HG3 represents the unmutated CLL, while NET1 represents the mutated. As you can see the difference in the band intensity, it is almost nothing in NET1, but it's there in HG3. Since that there is, yeah. We are shown that EZH2 activates the pathway in HG3 cell lines through overexpressing IGH1R expression. We managed to downregulate EZH2 in HG3 cell line, and this downregulation was followed by a Western plotting experiment and in vitro kinase assay. Both experiments revealed that following the downregulation of EZH2, the pathway itself also reduced in the activity. But when we treated these cell lines, by chemical inhibitors that are targeting the HMT activity, which is the canonical mode of action of uh, EZH2, neither Western plotting nor in vitro kinase assay showed any impact on the pathway. And that would confirm that EZH2 is functioning in this regard independently of PRC2, and we are showing that it is done through overexpression of the gene IGF1 R. So coming back to our sheep sequencing, the IGF1 R promoter. Uh, is viewed to be differentially enriched and more significantly enriched for EZH2 in the unmutated CLL samples. And that was, of course, validated by the sheet PCR in the independent samples. And in addition to that, the RNA sequencing is revealing that IGF1R is overexpressed in unmutated compared to mutated. So, just to simplify it, more enrichment for EZH2, more expression. Fine. That was validated in the large cohort of CLL, 96 samples or uh, 86 samples. 
And uh, we found uh, that it is yes, overexpressed in unmutated compared to unmutated, and most interestingly, actually, we saw that easy to do is shown almost the same pattern that was observed for highly of one R. So we managed to correlate both of them, and we came up with significant positive correlation between easy to do and highly of one R. Thus, we were becoming closer and closer to the postulation that highly of one R is positively controlled by easy to do. And that was also further confirmed in the cell lines. Following silencing of EZH2, IGF1 R shows reduced expression and mRNA and protein as well. And we also did sheep experiment. And it revealed that the silencing of EZH2 was not associated by any significant change regarding the enrichment of the prototypical H3K27 and 3 And interestingly, the active marks showed significant reduced occupancy. So we asked them how easy the tool is functioning in this non-canonical model actually. Upon checking the genome cursor, we found an expected binding site for uh, CNIC at the IGF1 R for model, and that was overlapping with the binding site for easy the tool that we have obtained from our sheep sequencing. So we thought then that perhaps easy the tool might be cooperating with CNIC for transactivating IGF1 R. And then the mechanics of work once again we managed to silence either EZH2 or CNN or both of them. And it was associated, of course, with this pattern of reduced expression, as you can see, mRNA and protein. We asked them, which is recruiting which then? Is it EZH2 that is recruiting CNN or the other way around? Silencing of CNN was not associated by any significant change regarding the enrichment pattern of EZH2 at the promoter region of IGF1R while the other y band was observed after we silenced easy bitch 2 CMIC reduces. So then, it is easy bitch 2 that is recruiting CMIC at the object from our promoter and proceeds for the overexpression of the gene in this uh, subgroup of CLF. And we are showing also that uh, the activation of the pathway by easy bitch 2 is done through the activation of IGF from R, which would make sense actually for a couple of reasons. IGF1R is an upstream component in the signaling circuit and, uh, uh, and also its silencing in the uh, HGA3 cell lines and how it affected the pathway was somehow comparable to the effect that we have observed when we silence EZH2 in the same cell line system. So to conclude, EZH2 preferentially locates IGF1R promoter in the unmutated CLL and in a cooperation with CNIC, it will overexpress IGF1R and accordingly PIPK APT signaling and that will contribute in part to the progression and the aggressiveness of this subtype of CLL. The last project, DNA methylation at the infragenic CTG island controls PRC2 mediated transcriptional regulation of MNX1 in CLL. I apologize, actually, I'm drinking a lot, but... <laughs> yeah, we were also obsessed by the mode of recruitment of PRC2 across the genome. In the nanas, it is very, very less straightforward than the case in Drosophila, because the Drosophila genome contains uh, some elements called the polycomp response element that would serve in the direct recruitment of PRC2 to the target sites. But that is not the case when it comes to the nanogram genome. PRC2 has no consensus binding site. However, it was found to be preferentially locating the CPG islands as long as they are unmethylated and untranscribed. And such recruitment is done through the ancillary subunit GR2 or the polycompite proteins. So the question for this uh, paper actually was to understand the cross-talk between CPG island methylation and polycomp oppressive complex 2 functionality or presence. So we, we thought about inducing global gene methylation in MEC1 cell lines, the model of CLL, and that was followed by um, RNA-seq analysis. And we came up with these differentially expressed genes. There were 6,500 genes, and they were clustered to these head processes. And interestingly, we came up also with PI3K APT signaling in these genes, but that wasn't our concern for this paper, actually. So, these genes were subclassified based on the log 4 change expression into DAC upregulated and DAC downregulated. The DAC downregulated represented approximately 
uh, 35% of these differentially expressed genes, and they were likely to be positively controlled by methylation. So we managed to overlap these genes, the diagram regulated genes, with the hypermethylated genes that I talked to you about from MBD sequencing that I was discussing in the first paper. So we came up with, yeah, I think it's not clear here, but they are eight.